Hello, this is professional video game expert Tim Rogers. You are watching Kotaku.com. Today we're going to talk about Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a game about a little boy from Yorkshire. <sighs> we really do need to buy ourselves a new depth probe. Who lives on a stone dragon, wears an old-timey diving suit, and professionally recovers treasures, which have sunken into the ocean, which is made of clouds. His big sister, and or girlfriend, can't find any clothes, and is also a sword. Thank you, Rex. Now place your hand on my chest. Oops! I think my nose is bleeding. I really gotta get a humidifier in here. Where are my dude's butt area pants sleeves? Where are most of this lady's clothes? Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is huge and loud. It has a comically complicated battle system. The plot is some anime nonsense. What is the Aegis? Really? And the script is a lot of yelling. Damn it! It exhibits a brain-blasting mastery of 3D environment design. It's a Super Nintendo game, microwave mutated for the 2017 generation. It is a brand new, stupid huge JRPG, and you can play it on your television or on the toilet. Playing it will reveal to you many reasons why they do not make them like this anymore. However, the grand gesture of it is ultimately enthralling. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is exactly itself, in the hugest and most persistent possible way. It just does not stop being itself. I've played the first 10 hours of the game twice. This video will cover the first 6 hours. I'm going to gently spoil some stuff from the prologue chapter. Let's talk about the voice acting. Nintendo is making a Japanese language track available as free DLC on launch day. This DLC was not available to me in advance of the release, so I played the game in English. I could have turned the voice volume down to a ghostly whisper, though I decided to give the voice actors a chance. And what a chance it was! When it gets dark in the game's day-night cycle, the characters have a little canned conversation about the hour of the day. It's a little jarring to hear this exact conversation every time. When did it get so late? Oh, and I've started glowing. I'm a bit self-conscious. Likewise, this conversation about having reached a landmark on the map just about tore my brain in half after 19 repetitions. And arrived. <laughs> All in one piece. And arrived. <laughs> All in one piece. If you've watched my Final Fantasy VII translation videos, you know that I lived in Japan for 10 years. I speak Japanese well enough to order PC parts over a payphone, and I can say that repetition in Japanese is a natural part of the language. In Japan, if it's hot outside, you'll hear people greeting each other with the phrase, Atsui desu ne, it's hot, isn't it? People say this over and over again, as though trying to match one another's inflection perfectly. It's incredible. It's language as a bonding exercise. It's why superhuman fighters yelling the names of their techniques in cartoons sounds cool in Japanese and, uh, like this in English. Ha! Thank you can take Don't me! Don't forget Yata! me! Don't forget Thank me! Thank you can take me! Thank you can take me! Don't forget me! Thank you can take me! Don't forget me! Don't forget me! Thank you can take me! Thank you can take me! Don't forget me! Thank you can take me! Don't forget me! Thank you can take me! Don't forget me! Thank you can take me! Great! Don't forget me! Thank you can take me! Everyone's getting psyched! So that's a fundamental linguistic explanation for weird voice acting. Now let's talk about creative choices. Well, our main character is a little boy from Yorkshire. He sounds like Theon Greyjoy, performing at gunpoint in a military jail. Three hundred years? I'll be long dead by then. All over the world of Xenoblade are these little caddish buddies called Nopons, and they have the insipid habit of repeatedly speaking this word. It's life, man! There's still more than I give to non-friend. Which, coincidentally, is a three-letter summary of the sort of person I just don't like. British accents are a shortcut to sophistication as far as an American is concerned, so the contrast between that accent and lines like this is somewhat painful. Ma, 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 ma! Bad enough to people excuses! 
is a proponent! These little buddies all talk like they're posting pictures of their cats on Live Journal in 1999. Rex looking high spirits? Ah, uh, no, how say? Yes, Pepe. Speaking of cats, look at this cool big weird lion tiger guy. Uh, of course he's British. That seems prudent, my lady. Does he look to you like someone who would yell, make haste and retreat over and over during battle? Well, if not, have I got a surprise for you. Make haste and retreat. Ultimately, it's the genre conventions of the Japanese role-playing video game that's responsible for much of the voice weirdness. Like, look, I know this is just how it is in these games. Though try to tell me there's not about 1600% too much dead air between lines of dialogue. David Mamet would have three apoplectic heart attacks between every two lines of dialogue in this game. I haven't known them very long. But you know, they're still my crew. Your crew? Even after they tried to kill you? That's as may be. But they're the closest thing I have to a family. Nia? Right, let's go. Also, let me just say that in that dialogue right there, my characters had just hung out with this girl for several days and saved her life like twice. So I would definitely Facebook unfriend her after that conversation. I'm sure a lot of the commenters are going to tell me that the English voice acting isn't that bad and that I'm overreacting. If you like it, that's great. Check this out though. What the? In summary, I give the English voice acting an I can't wait for that Japanese voice DLC out of 10. Enough about how the characters are saying what they're saying, let's talk about what they're saying. I mean this as a compliment. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is the sort of game where the art, the world building, and the writing are pretty much the same thing. It brings me back to the glory days of 1990s JRPGs on the SNES and PlayStation. The concept at the core of the world building is a bonkers bar napkin sketch of an idea, blossomed out in obsessive detail. In this world, humans live on the backs of massive beasts called titans. Some of them are small, like the one that our hero lives on. Some of them are huge and support massive metropolitan cities. In addition to this, we have the fiction of drivers, tough core bad butts, whose robo-swords, or blades, have living counterparts which lurk sinisterly behind them during ferocious battles. This all brings me right back to that day one kid in middle school in 1991 told another, dude, there's cartoons in Japan, and they're so much better than Thundercats, dude. Having said that, the writing is certainly not on par with literature such as the HBO series Deadwood. And I don't care! I promise I'm not joking when I say I love the stupid little inconsistencies in this game. Like here, when Rex meets the mercenary group Torna for the first time in the opening cutscenes. Drivers? And... Blades. It's like, I realize this is direct translation of the Japanese, though like, in the fiction of this world, it's the presence of a blade that makes a driver a driver, so like, why would he be surprised by one any more than by the other? Rex is a little boyishly enthralled with the appearances of the drivers. Whoa, they look so cool. Yes, Rex, they do look cool. That's because they're Tetsuya Nomura characters. Somehow Square Enix let Tetsuya Nomura work with his old buddy, Zeno director Tetsuya Takahashi, to design a couple characters for this game. Whoa, that's two Tetsuyas in one game! I gotta say, uh, let's get this out of the way. I sorta make fun of him a lot. Like, that time I told my friend, I bet he irons his t-shirts. Though as of this game, I now realize that I have, in fact, always admired Tetsuya Nomura. He's, uh really cool. Have you heard about how a lot of the designs he did way back in the PlayStation 1 era had elements he threw in just to challenge the 3D modelers? Final Fantasy VIII's hero Squall's fur collar, for example. So yeah, with that in mind, take a look at Jin's hilarious, fluffy, flat-ironed hairstyle right here. Seriously, look at these mother hackers. Aw, oh, heck. Tetsuya Nomura even drew their menu portraits. Like, these guys are seriously named Malos 
and Sever. Clearly, these are names Tetsuya Nomura thought of himself. Tetsuya Nomura, you magnificent blaster. What are you, 12? Wait, maybe you are 12. The first female lead character we meet is visibly as much of a small child as the hero, yet pounces upon every opportunity to chide him for his immaturity. Bonus, she has cat ears. Some games trope gently when it comes to anime. Xenoblade 2 strings tropes upon tropes. It's trope on a rope, buddy! We pay you low lives a lot, so don't screw it up! Wow, my little sister is mean. What? What? is that thing? That's not a thing, Rex. It's a girl. It's a... girl? Yes, did you not hear me? I wonder if the other characters also notice Rex is younger than them. Hey, brat! Don't even think about touching that! That's enough yapping, you pair of brats! Let's move! Oh, I guess they do. Thank you, Rex. Now place your hand on my chest. Nia, call the Monoceros. Man, I don't have the Monoceros's number. Look, if you love anime, this game has anime. I'd be a huge jerk to criticize this game's cutscenes as being too long. If you don't want long anime cutscenes, don't play this game. On the other hand, if you plan to skip the cutscenes, why would you play this game? You can't possibly pry the anime out of this game's iron grip, even with a thousand crowbars. Having said that, I just have to employ mathematics to bring you the following data. Here, there's a four minute and nine second cutscene depicting a dramatic battle between our hero and a boss. Next, we play the boss battle, which lasts just 3 minutes and 12 seconds. Following this is a 5 minute and 20 second cutscene depicting the action-packed conclusion to this battle. I'm not saying this sucks. I'm not even saying that it's stupid. I'm just putting it out there, man. What's the deal with that appearance? I'm guessing your goal is Elysium. That is our dream! Heck, you know, with all these battles and cutscenes, I've forgotten whether or not my girlfriend and or big sister, who is also a sword, has large boobies. Oh, yes, that's right. She does. I know Nintendo's censored some games in the past for their Western releases to, like, how much less could she possibly be wearing in the Japanese version? When we get to the first big town, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 does that thing where all the characters explain a plot device to the main character. The idiot hero trope in a JRPG is common. The dumb protagonist stands in for us. They're having new experiences alongside us. Then we swap one character out for another, and now that character explains stuff to us as well. Wow, a game hasn't felt so much like high school since, uh, Persona 5, I guess. In the first town, we learn of the blade bonding system. This is just one of the game's 13,000 meta systems which feed into the larger battle system. We learn that drivers touch a core crystal, and this results in the birth of a blade. Our hero is like, wait, that's not how I got my blade in the cutscene like an hour ago. And the other characters are like, because that's how it normally is, idiot. The one instance of this thing that you've seen so far in the story is in fact unusual. We showed you the unusual instance first, so that the mundane instance would be the surprise, instead of the other way around, which is probably the way you would have written this if you were the one writing the story. Except you're not writing the story, you're in jail now, and it's our jail. You might as well love it, and I do love it. Personally, my favorite animes just so happen to be the ones whose writers literally have to use a calculator to keep the story straight. I see half your core is missing. Seems you've taken on quite a burden. And this is an itch that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 excels in scratching. Let's talk about the game design. You're all mine. Wow. In Zelda, you wouldn't need a skill to break a pot. I mean, is breaking stuff a skill? 
A casual observer might walk away with the mistaken impression that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a game about tutorials. It has a lot of tutorials. It has a million billion little systems intertwined in a heap of screaming snakes on the floor. For the first 10 hours of the game, tutorials will butt in with ferocity. The written words of the tutorials are a masterclass in passive aggression. The game begs to bend your ear for several windows, before teasing that it's going to be back later whether you want it to or not. Then it has the gall to tell you, anyway, you should probably concentrate on the game now. I want to complain about these tutorials, though it's a bit of a catch-22. Without them, I'd have no idea how to play the game. And you'd better pay attention to them because you can't bring them back once they're gone. For example, the first time I played the game, I definitely did not understand blade combos. Oh no, I, uh... Sort of still don't. Sometimes a tutorial ends and then you walk for literally seven seconds in one direction before another tutorial jumps in. The game also does this with cutscenes. Wow, it's like they asked my Sunday school to design this UI in 1992. Here's how complicated the rat's nest of game systems gets. More than twice, I've witnessed the characters discuss a game mechanic during an in-story context dialogue. At the conclusion of the dialogue, the game sees fit to slide in a tutorial, making sure you realize that what the characters were just talking about is, in fact, also a thing in the game. As a brief aside, apropos of nothing, when I was a teenager, I'd sit at the dinner table and eat a bowl of Frosted Flakes while reading the instruction manual of new JRPGs I'd just rented at Blockbuster. Shout me out in the comments if you remember JRPG instruction manuals. They were huge and glossy and they smelled nice. They smelled like anime. I miss them. Yes, I have been shopping yet! All of these tutorials, dialogues, and shops trickle into the battle system. I love the wheels off a good battle system. JRPGs need battle systems. Because otherwise, players will realize they can just watch TV. What's a blowdown? Is that like a showdown? First! Duh. Nicely done! Knockback? I thought knockback meant I got knocked back. Xenoblade is so fidgety with its tutorials because it needs you to understand the game's complicated battle system. The game's battle system has to be complicated because, in a shocking twist, if the battle system wasn't complicated, the game would be too hard. This is a topic that fascinates me. I could do a one-hour video on JRPG battle systems. Please let me know in the comments if you'd watch that. Please don't let me make that video. JRPG battle systems pose an incredible challenge to a game designer. The simpler and purer a battle system, the more the player feels like a failure when they lose. Look at Fire Emblem, Advance Wars, Shining Force, and XCOM. Games with tactical battle systems, which use clearly defined probabilities and small integers. These games have well-earned reputations for ruthless difficulty. Xenoblade, however, is a big-budget game whose audience consists of a wide range of players. Some of these players genuinely love micromanaging their loadouts for optimal efficiency in RPG battles. Some of them just want to hang out with some anime. Die! I'll do as I please! Come on! Die! Did yeah! I think both of these types of players are beautiful. The game designer's job when designing a battle system for an RPG with such a wide audience is to make it mathematically complex enough to reward weirdos like me, while also keeping it smooth enough to entertain weirdos like me. This results in battle systems where, sometimes, to be perfectly honest, you don't really know what you're doing. Sometimes you die, and when you die, you feel like, Maybe I should have done something a little differently. You enter the next battle, thinking, Let's do something a little differently. You do something a little differently. You're not sure what. You succeed. Hooray! Putting yourself in the mindset to put yourself in a different mindset was enough to conjure success. By the way, I'd recommend fighting all the enemies in this first dungeon while you have overpowered dudes in your party because you can level up sort of a lot. Oh, sorry. That was a tip, wasn't it? I promise not to reveal any more tips.
I understand that you viewers don't come to my videos for tips, seeing as you're all a lot smarter than me, and of course better than me at video games. You're all such great pro-level game likers, and I'm just some scrubby content creator. In all sincerity, I like the battle system. I'm at the very least smart enough to learn how to consistently win at boss battles, and I'm honest enough to admit that I don't always correctly anticipate enemies' strategies. I guess this means the battles are intuitive? Battles flow like a MOBA meets an MMO. It's got tanks and aggroing. Battle conditions require you to be constantly changing up your position with regard to the enemy's facing direction and such. Your ability and accessory loadouts are minutely micromanageable in meaningful ways. It's good to chill with, and it's good to get hot with. Hey, sounds like a video game to me! Now let's wrap up with a little segment where we talk about the good stuff. I honestly love how big the font is. The Nintendo Switch has really been a hero for UI design because it requires developers to make fonts big enough to read in portable mode. It owns. LOL. Let's not forget that Xenoblade's director, Tetsuya Takahashi, is the guy who literally put Jesus into his game Xenosaga. He also directed Xenogears. So you better believe Xenoblade Chronicles 2's story is full of crazy leaps of logic, bonkers twists, and wacky turns. Another signature of Tetsuya Takahashi's is environments of enormous scale. Anyone who's played Xenogears on the PlayStation knows what I'm talking about. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 keeps on carrying that torch. The use of space in some of the environments is truly incredible. I don't want to spoil too much, so here's some of the first city. The environments are teeming with what my friends and I call honest geometry. Building interiors are exactly the size you'd expect based on their exteriors. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 hammers this feeling home over and over again, in both friendly zones and dungeons. Yasunori Mitsuda returns to the Zeno series once again with another rich musical score. His battle themes are visceral. His environment themes are atmospheric, and they sublimely transition between day and night variations. If you're a fan of Chrono Trigger vibes, you're going to need to pump the volume up to the max to drown out your own screams of joy. Nintendo and Monolith gave Mitsuda a budget, and Mitsuda loves that budget up and down the orchestra pit. I have to give special credit to the title screen music, a simple, haunting piano melody. When you first start up the game, there's no title on the screen, just dark clouds, and the sound of pounding rain under this piano melody. You could fall asleep to this and probably wake up two IQ points smarter. Finally, I just gotta shout out the loot boxes. They just give them to you. You don't even have to pay real world money. If that don't sell them, I don't know what will. Right about now, you're probably asking what I think about loot boxes. Well, I'll tell you what I think about loot boxes. I was born stupid. However, I will not die hungry. Video games forever, Kotaku.com or the day one patch edition.